it seems totally normal to listen to a podcast about the Toronto Argonauts. It's the X's and Argos podcast. Welcome to the X's and Argos weekly podcast brought to you by Funny Bone Broth as we kick off our 2022 season of Toronto Argonauts coverage. You can, of course, find all of our stuff at xsandargos.com. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so that our podcasts show up right there on your phone all season long. My name is Ben Grant. I'm joined, as always, by JB. And if you're new to the podcast, welcome. We're happy to have you on board. And if you're a regular listener, thank you so much for letting us back into your lives for the 2022 season. JB, last year was a lot of fun. A short season, but a lot of fun. Are you ready to do it all over again? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. You better be, because we're in until uh, end of November. It's a, it's a bit of a long run, but uh, yeah, I think I think we're ready to go. The, you know, the team looks good. I, I, I feel like we're we're in a good scenario, so I'm excited to get back to it. And it, you know, the the rest was nice, but yeah, I'm ready to get going again. On this episode of the X's and Argos podcast, we are going to talk about the signings that have been made since our free agency special. And if you didn't get any of the signings for this offseason at all, you can find that on our free agency special we recorded back in mid-February. You can also read about all of the players that were signed on X'sandargos.com. We've got a little article up about each one of them if you need a little bit more information. We're going to talk about the release of Jamal Campbell, right tackle, and that was a surprise to a lot of people. So we'll talk about what transpired there and who's going to play right tackle this season. We'll then get into the potential of other big names being traded or released. Um, if Jamal Campbell can go, is anybody else potentially on, on the block or in, in danger of being traded or released? Then we'll get a little bit into the CFL and slash global combine. We'll talk a little bit about the Argos wanting the league to acknowledge the rent disparity in Toronto and Vancouver compared to the other CFL cities. And we'll wrap things up by talking about Touchdown Atlantic. It is back. All that is coming up on this episode of the X's and Argos podcast. JB, let's get into the signing. So I know Ja'Kai Polite was the, the first player signed after we recorded last time. Uh, you know a little bit about him, I guess, from the time that he spent with the Jets. Your brother, a big Jets fan. Uh, what does the name Ja'Kai Polite mean to your brother? Uh, well, his only text response was, I hope he shows up on time. Um, yeah. Mr. Mr. Polite um, was not a great professional football player. Uh, for the New York Jets. His issue is that he seems to, and you know, we don't, we don't know the guy, but he seems to have motivation issues. Now, what I like about this, and probably what you like about this too, is that he's yet another lottery ticket. We've talked about this last year, and some of them, actually a lot of them last year, worked out very well. Uh, CN Power, uh, of course, uh, Sean Oakman, was probably the best lottery ticket that that the Argos took last year, like he was sensational. And going into the season, we weren't sure if we would get anything from him at all. Uh, and Ja'Kai Polite's a little bit like that. In college, he was amazing. He was all SEC, and that's, you know, that, that's saying something. Uh, and he was projected to be a first-round pick, uh, like a high first-round pick. But then everything kind of blew up at the Combine. His, his numbers were, were terrible. And then his pro day numbers were even worse than that. And so the impression that a lot of people around the league got were just simply that he wasn't wasn't motivated and, and wasn't serious about being a professional football player. So he ends up getting drafted in the third round by the Jets. Uh, according to Pro Football Talk, he amassed $100,000 in, in late fines, late fees, um, being late for meetings, etc. And then he was released. And you just never see something like that where a third round pick gets released before the season. I can't think of of many examples of that happening. It, it's an interesting it's an interesting kind of arc because you would think at that point he would have washed out of football. Well, he gets picked up just after that by Seattle and they only had him for a couple of weeks. And and then if you weren't thinking at that point before, you'd think well now, but then he got picked up by the Rams and it actually seemed to go fairly well. Uh they they ended up hanging on to him for a while, but then they released him, I think it was mid-playoff run. 
And it, it was just the, the timing of it was really odd. And you just wondered, you know, were there, were there other issues? My view on this is a pretty positive one in that, you know, what you're, it's, it's not a big risk. And so you bring, you bring them in and if you can get any of that all SEC effort that you got from Ja'Kai Polite, and there's reason to think you can because we've seen guys come here and, and do that. And I don't know if it's pinball. I don't know if it's Coach Dinwiddie that we saw last year with, with guys like Oakman. But if he is motivated, then this is, this is a huge win for the Argos because it's, it's not a huge expense to, to take a flyer on a guy like this. And yeah, the, the potential ceiling, the potential payoff is, is massive. So I'm all for it. I, my expectations aren't high. Uh, because typically this doesn't work out, but we've seen it work out in the past, and and we're hoping both for both for him and and for the Argonauts, uh, it would be great to have him uh, looking how he looked when he was a Florida Gator. Because man, he was he was good. Yeah, I'm gonna put uh, my faith in pinball again. Um, that they're not gonna bring a, you know the expression you know bring a bad man onto the bus. Um, obviously it's, it's, it's quick to get rid of if, if it's not working out, but I, I'm going to, they have earned the benefit of the doubt that, um, that they feel like this is a guy who, you know, is, is a bit of a lottery ticket, but is not, um, you know, is not a last ditch attempt that this is a guy who sincerely wants to continue, uh, with his football career. Um, so I, I, you know, they've earned the bed for the doubt and, uh, you know, I hope, I hope it works as well as Oakman. He, he isn't quite, he doesn't quite have the measurables Oakman does. Um, but if he can be, yeah, I mean, they need it. I mean, they need, they need youth on that line. It's a position of need. So yeah, I, I really hope it does work out because I think he'll have every chance to be a starter when you look at the D line room. Yeah, for sure. When you look at him on the end, like, like I, I think we're looking at Jagera Davis starting at one of the end spots. Uh, we don't know exactly what's going on with Shane Ray because I know he was getting some looks uh, down south. But if he's back, it's probably Ray on the other side if Ray can stay healthy. But Polite's right in there in that mix after that. So yeah, it, it it could be it could be a job that he could win. And you know, if things don't work out, well, you know, we've got some other guys in here too that can maybe. Um, maybe give uh, those those two guys I mentioned a, a run for the money. So yeah, it's that's a nice I, I think that's a nice move. I think it's a great signing. And like you said, I have faith in pinball. Let's 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 hope he can turn things around and and show us that he can be a professional football player. The next guy that we brought in was D'Angelo Amos. Um like D'Angelo Amos, the brother of Deshaun Amos who is, you know, recently acquired by the Argonauts. Uh, he's going to be competing probably for probably for starting halfback job. I think that's that's where Deshaun Amos fits in. D'Angelo Amos, I'm less sure about. I I don't see as much in his film. Now, he played at James Madison and at Virginia. Uh, his film is a little different than what you see from Deshaun. He played a lot more in the box and you know, was a bit more physical. He just doesn't grade quite as consistently uh, as Deshaun does. But what I really like about him is he's an excellent punt returner. And so I think if he's going to take some time to maybe get acclimated to the CFL secondary and play a little bit better there, see his play increase uh, and improve, he's going to get a shot through punt returning first. I think that is how he's going to make this roster. So like at James Madison, he's second in school history in punt return yardage. And what made him so gifted as a punt returner wasn't the elite speed necessarily. It's he's really slippery, really evasive. He's one of those guys that is extremely calm when there are bodies flying all over the place in the middle of a pack. He just sort of, you know, keeps his feet moving, has great vision, finds those little gaps and he's also one of those guys that gets the most out of every return. If it was possible to get 19 yards, he'll get all 19 yards. So, you know, I, I know you've been you've been searching for a punt return specialist for a while. He may <laughs> no. be the guy. I'm not gonna you know begin the year by dredging up that uh, that war horse. Um, he, he, he's, I think that's great. It is a position of need. Um, he's got some decent size to him. He could also be a nice special teamer. Um, when he's not returning punts, obviously, um, yeah, I, I'm. I think it's good to bring him in and give him a shot. It, it, it was an area that they, you know, that it's not make or break. But I think to improve 
upon their punt return would be a goal, and that's a good step. Yeah, he he could actually. You're right when you say like the other areas of special teams. He he played on pretty much every team's unit. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. He's also a, a block specialist, like punt block, field goal block. He had a number of those in college. Yeah, so. I I think he's a nice. I mean, honestly, I think if his if his punt return is is good, I I think for sure he makes the squad. The next guy the Argos brought in was Kendall Futrell, a defensive end from. Uh, the East Carolina Pirates, and this was funny when they when they signed him. I immediately was like, I I know that name, and it's not like I typically watch a lot of East Carolina football. I don't, but I've watched so much East Carolina film over the last like two years because of all the CFL guys that have been brought in uh, from ECU. It feels like so many guys have been brought in. So I when I started watching film, I'm like, I've I've seen this before. I've seen this I've seen this game like seven times already. And so it didn't take me very long. I was like, oh yeah, it's this guy, this guy, right. Uh and he yeah, he looks great. Uh he's sort of he's a, a linebacker that would walk down and he he played the majority of his snaps sort of as a as a rush end. And that's what he'd be. He's got great speed. He's got a really nice inside move, which is a wonderful compliment for an edge rusher with speed to be able to beat guys inside to have that fear that just opens stuff even more up on the outside. Uh, my only concern with him is he's not a very big guy. You know, he he looks more like a, a will backer, and that was his problem when he was his brief stint in the NFL with the Bengals and and Texans. They wanted to make him a will backer because that's that's kind of what he looks like. Maybe even a, a Mac in the CFL, but uh, that's just not who he is. He needs to be. Coming off the edge, that's when he's at his best. Um, and he's not a guy that you really want in coverage. And the issue, uh, furthermore, is that he's not great against the run. So CFL is the right league for him. But that you know, could potentially be a liability. Maybe he's part of a rotation uh, if he impresses the coaches. I, I don't see him as, as an every down end. But he's another guy that I'm curious to see in camp. And a guy that does show up on film. So... You know, we'll see what we've got in him in, you know, a few weeks time, I guess. Yeah, I I don't think there, you know, I think he's, you put him in the mix and maybe he's your seventh defensive lineman. It, it's, you know, it's a, just a solid bottom of the roster churn pick. The next guy the Argos brought in was Acadia's Matt Gledhill. Uh, and this was, this sort of surprised me because I was thinking mentally as Gleddy as being like a, 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 a draft pick. Because uh, he was a part of the he was part of the early combines, and so I wasn't really, you know, thinking of him as a guy that could be signed. But it is an interesting loophole because the way the CFL draft works. So basically, for eligibility, you are eligible three years after you complete your first year of post secondary school, and uh, so his draft year would have been last year. And of course, they missed the 2020 season, so a lot of things got muddled up. He was one of the guys that was invited back to the combine because he didn't really have uh, that that combine experience and that um, you know the the occasion to show off his talents, etc. Um, in previous years, and so they they brought him into the combine. He really impressed, and a couple of days later, the Argos are like, "Okay, let's let's just sign this guy." What I love about it is I've kind of projected him as being like a you know a third. Uh, maybe fourth round pick. It's hard to tell just off combine alone. And film is a bit weird because his 2019 film is the the film that I think looks best. And that's a while ago now. So he he has a few more question marks in there. But uh, yeah, in terms of value, to be able to sign the guy without having to spend a draft pick, I think is amazing value. So it feels like we got a bonus uh, CFL draft pick on that. And, you know, he he's another guy that could turn into something, another guy that will be, uh, certainly in the special teams mix, uh, he's a good receiver. And I kind of see him, you know, competing with Sam Baker, with Tommy Neal, uh, with a lot of those other Canadian guys and see if he can get some field time, see if he can get, play some teams and maybe it turns into something. Uh, what I like about it is it really reinforces the belief that the Argo scouting staff um, are on top of things, you know, are looking to to exploit loopholes are looking for talent in places that people might not necessarily expect it to be that they're not just, you know, you, you can do the draft and then, you know, you can sign XFL guys and that's fine, but that they are actively looking for talent in places that other people are not. And that, that is something that, uh, 
that I find very encouraging, you know, whether he turns out or not, um, the fact that that is their operational philosophy is, is great to see. The Argus front office is really good. I've been impressed with them since since the the arrival of Pinball Clemens. They really have turned stuff around, and we've seen the elevation of Vince Magri. I wrote an article about Vince Magri a little while ago because I believe he is the most important person in that room, but they all contribute. They all do amazing things. I just really like Vince as a scout. I think he's got a really good eye for talent. And, you know, I don't know who it is that's involved in this move or that move. I don't know exactly how that works every time when they bring a guy in, you know, whose guy is he? There is sort of a collective element to that. But I do think a lot of it goes back to to Vince Magri. So you don't want to get so predictable where it's like, here comes the Calgary guy. And then here comes the guy from the Houston XFL. Here comes another guy from, you know what I mean? You you don't want to just simply become a team. That does that. So I, I think this is I think it's a really good sign of of their their mindset. So I'm, you know, I, I don't think, you know, we'll see. We'll see what the kid turns out to be. But, uh, you know, I, I salute the idea. And the last guy that they brought in uh, was it's probably the guy I'm most excited about, I guess. A.J. Richardson, receiver. I'll tell you what I like about him. So. Well, actually, I like a lot of things about him. So first of all, he's Boise State, which always rings a bell because Coach Dinwiddie is Boise State. And you know Coach Dinwiddie is still connected to Boise State. And so anytime they bring in, you, you see this anywhere. If if a coach brings in or a general manager brings in someone from their alma mater, uh, they have, they've got word from someone else like, hey, you got to look at this guy. You got to take, take a take a shot on this guy what if a coach and, brings in his entire previous organization yeah well that but that's worked out well like i'm pretty yeah. happy with all the calgary guys that have yeah. come over but that's but that's the same thing it's exactly it yeah. you know coach Dinwiddie looks over and he's like hey we, these calgary guys are available i know they're good and he's not wrong no you know, the guys that have come in they're, they're great so you know that's that's the advantage that that you have bringing in guys that you know and boise state's the same thing you know he didn't coach there it wasn't that sort of relationship, like bringing the Calgary guys, but he's got contacts, he's got connections, and he's paid close attention to the team, just as you do. So AJ Richardson, uh, six feet two twelve. So at Boise State, AJ Richardson was stuck behind uh, Cedric Wilson, who's uh, now with the Miami Dolphins, uh, previously with the Dallas Cowboys, and Thomas Spurbeck, who was Boise State's all-time receiving leader in just about every category. And so he didn't get a lot of time. And then suddenly, as uh, as a senior, his play took off when those guys weren't there. And he had an amazing season and really drew a lot of attention. He didn't get drafted in the 2019 draft, but he ended up actually beating out drafted players by the Cardinals uh, for a practice squad spot. And again, it was an unfortunate scenario where... He ends up, of all teams, he ends up on the Cardinals, who had a stacked receiving core uh, in 2019 and a really difficult place to get onto the field. His preseason film is really good. I really got excited watching that. You know, watching the, his Boise State stuff, you know, that, that's great. It's harder to quantify sometimes, though, especially Boise State. They, you know, they, they play a lot of strange teams and it's difficult to gauge talent. It's really easy to diff- to gauge talent when you're watching NFL, even NFL preseason, because I know who a lot of those guys are. And he made some corners look foolish. He came off as an intelligent receiver. He made really good reads, ran crisp routes, a really nice route runner. I, I love this. The problem is where to put him. I don't think you see a lot of guys like him come in right away to start, but I also wouldn't rule it out. Again, I'm, I'm really high on his talent. I see him as an X receiver, and that's the spot currently filled by DeVaris Daniels. But he can also play in the, in the slot. Uh, he did a little bit of both at, at Boise and also uh, was mixed around a little bit at uh, Arizona. So he can play inside. He can play outside. He could play just about anywhere on the CFL field. So that opens up a lot of possibilities for him. We'll know pretty soon when camp starts. So we'll, we'll get an idea right away. But yeah, if, if he were just a little bit more explosive he'd be in the NFL. There's no question about that because everything else he's got is is really solid. He catches the ball well, but really nice route running, really nice technique, blocks well. Everything else about his game I love. So 
I, I, I expect him to stick around. He's the guy I'm most excited about, like I said, off the top. And I would be surprised if he's not on the roster come the regular season. Yeah, his name may come up again when we, when we talk uh, salary cap uh, victims. Recently, Jamal Campbell, right tackle for the Toronto Argonauts, was released. Uh, this came as a shock, I think, to both of us. I think to a lot of fans. He was a fan favorite. He's a local guy. He's, you know, C.W. Jeffries, York University. He's been very involved in the community. And he was playing quite well. He was had a pretty good season up until his, his injury last year. What's your feeling on this? The reason for the release, JB? Well, I, I think it has to be... I mean, I think it has to be the cap. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, Pinball's quote, I thought Pinball's quote was quite quite telling. On on the Argos website, you know, where he talked about, given the direction, I'm content it was myself who communicated to Jamal. And Pinball talked about how, you know, the football was, uh, you know, a, a great game, but a terrible business. So, I mean, I... You don't have to read between the lines to see that this is a business cap decision. Um, that's a lot of money to pay an offensive lineman who, you know, if, you, if you're going to pay that much money, to, you know, to be honest, you're going to need to be one of the top five offensive linemen in the league um, if, with that cap hit. So it, it, it's, it's not surprising. I mean, it, you know, happens in the NFL every year too. If you have a huge bonus coming, if you're not, you know, elite – you're never going to see that bonus. You know, they, the players know that. Um, so it, it was tough to see, especially being a Toronto kid. Uh, but I, I thought they handled it pretty well. I mean, that was very nice of Pinball to do it personally. Um, but uh, I think that was always on the cards. There was no chance he was going to get that bonus. Yeah, it, it is unfortunate. I know his contract was restructured going into last season, but ultimately this this, uh, you know, what was supposed to be uh, just around $200,000 coming up. Uh, and I believe he signed for 160 in Saskatchewan. It's just, it's just money that the Argos don't have right now. The math suggests they're pretty tight to the cap. And just even to bring in those guys that we talked about in the first segment, uh, you know, I, I know cap doesn't come into play quite yet, but to, to get close to that number, you had to release Jamal Campbell. And so then the question is, who plays right tackle? Campbell was a guy that we had not just penciled in. Uh, we had written down Campbell in in maybe not permanent marker, but at least pen. So where do we go for right tackle now? I, my thought is uh, Theron Churchill. He's a guy that they brought in specifically to be a tackle. I asked Vince Magri about that after they drafted him because I kind of viewed, I viewed Churchill as a guard. And when I talked to Vince Magri, about how he saw him he said no I, I see him as a tackle and I know Churchill has played guard but that's not unusual for new guys coming into the league rookies getting sort of their first taste of the CFL they often will start out at guard but they've got three Canadians uh, three Canadian draft picks of their own uh, who are all tackles in Shane Richards who was a first overall pick you got Theron Churchill a first round pick Dylan Giffen picked a little bit later in the draft, but he's a tackle as well. Like all three of those guys could be up for the spot. And I think they looked up and down the roster and, and they're thinking, you know, we've got to clear some money. If we let go of Campbell, at least we've got these three guys that we like, that we have drafted, uh, who we feel can can fill in. So I see it as a battle between those three players for that right tackle spot. And the nice thing about their Canadian flexibility is they don't need a Canadian right tackle. They can get away without one. It would be great if they didn't have to. If Churchill, uh, Richards, Giffen claims that right tackle spot, wonderful. But if not, they have the flexibility to be able to put in Ivy or Tate or you know who knows. Let's let's see what let's see what uh, shape Isaiah Cage is in. And if if he looks great, then they've got Dejan Allen, and maybe one of those guys goes to right tackle. So there are some answers, and that's I think that's why this decision ends up being made. They've got to make a big cut. This was the area that could I guess most efficiently absorb the loss of a big name player like that. And so I think that was why uh, Jamal Campbell was uh, was released, but. Like you said off the top, JB, it's it's sad because, yeah, he's a local guy and he's always been so good to to everybody in the media, the fans. So it's really sad to see him go. But 
I think that's the answer. I think it's Churchill. Do you see this going a different direction? Well, you, when you bring in a new offensive line coordinator, um, he may have connections, people that he, you know, whether he sees them in the draft, he knows they're on another roster right now. Um, there may, that may be, that's not unusual for an offensive line coach to, to, to go bring in one of his guys. And they haven't really done that yet. So that might be at work. He might have an idea. Um, he may, as many offensive line coach believes, he can coach up anybody. And uh, we'll see. I mean, it's it, offensive line is such a weird alchemy because sometimes you can get away with it. And sometimes you can find a guy who is not very heralded and you put him in and he's fine. Other times you get a hole in the side of your boat and it just leaks the whole season. Um, you know, so it it's it, there's no two ways about it. It's a gamble because as we both know, sometimes you get a hole on the offensive line and you just can't fill the damn hole. Um, and it breaks the no donkey rule. So it is a gamble. There's no two ways about it. Um, first real test for Coach Sweet um, to see if he's got somebody in his uh, Rolodex, if people still have Rolodexes. And, uh, I don't think they do. Coaches might. Offensive line coaches might. Maybe. Um, so he can check the old Rolodex. Um, or maybe he sees something in Churchill's film and he feels he can really coach him up. So... Uh, it's, it's, to me, it's, the, it's the, definitely one of the top questions heading into to camp because you, if, you don't, you know, if you don't have a guy there, that's a problem the whole season. You, you know, you just, it, it just destroys everything. So um, I'm excited to see what their plan is. I feel like they must be comfortable with, because instead of risking maybe we'll be able to get a guy in the draft. Like, I don't think that's the plan. I, they, this is not a front office that would go to war with that as a plan. So I think they're, I think they're looking at this as they feel comfortable in what they saw in the development of Churchill or, or Giffen or Richards. They saw something last year where they're like, okay, you know, I think, I think we'll be okay here. My only hesitation there is that's not what we saw late in the season when, Jamal Campbell was injured. It wasn't Churchill or Richards or Giffen that went in. Um, they went American at that position. So, you know, maybe that's maybe that and maybe that's their plan. Maybe they, you know, maybe they they feel comfortable with, with Ivy, or maybe they feel comfortable with the the combination of Cage and and Allen. Maybe they just got to get cap compliant and then not cap compliant. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. You don't, you don't but, have to be uh, cap, hopefully... you don't have to be cap compliant forever. Well, you don't have to at all in the off season, so you could kind of do as you please, I suppose, until until they have to be under that cap number. But it, it's best to be close to avoid a, a catastrophe. But JB, this transitions beautifully into our next segment. The question is: Is there somebody else, somebody else high profile like Jamal Campbell that may unfortunately be on their way out? Is there somebody that? that might have to be released or traded because of salary cap concerns. And I'm going to suggest that probably yes. And it's not a story I'm excited about. It's not an event I'm looking forward to see happen. But I do believe the Argos are pretty tight. And we saw last year how many guys, just because of injury troubles, and hopefully this year is not like last year, they were so beat up last year that they brought in like double, triple the number of guys they anticipated bring, needing to bring in. And that's what resulted in some of the moves we saw with Alden Darby having to be traded and Nick Arbuckle needing to be traded because these were salaries they just couldn't afford to keep if they were going to sign uh, more, especially more Canadians um, that they needed to sign. And, and so to make ends meet, they had to make moves. And I know they won't go into this season right up against the cap to start because it's just not a smart thing to do because you know there are going to be injuries. This is a, a full season now, a long season. They're going to need to make moves at some point. So you can't risk going in right up against the cap. So that's why I expect moves. In terms of who it's going to be, when I look at this roster, where they sort of have a surplus of talent is defensive back and wide receiver. Defensive back, you've got two guys on my most recent depth chart, and I'm going to make an updated one, I think probably uh, for next week. But on my last depth chart, 
I had Tristan Deku and Deshaun Amos and Kresden Butler, all three of those guys I had on the bench. And those are three starting caliber defensive backs in the CFL. They're all guys who have talent coming out of their ears. Kresden Butler was a starter last year. Deshaun Amos, we've seen do amazing things in the CFL. Tristan Deku was new to the CFL last year. He's really good. And I would feel comfortable with him at corner. I'd feel comfortable with him at halfback. And even actually Sam, now that I think about it. So there's a lot of spots for these guys. And, you know, there are some there are some bigger contracts out there. So, you know, I worry. I, I worry about who might be on their way out because I love this defensive backfield. I don't want to lose anybody there, but maybe that happens. Can you see that? I I could see a trade. I think I think the quality of their of their of their depth chart suggests trade more than cut um I, I don't i don't think so i think they're going to try and keep that because we saw last year how crucial it is to to have depth um at at wide receiver and defensive back you know they you know they really went deep into it uh it agreed it looks fantastic that secondary looks like it's going to be the best in the league the the second string secondary looks like it could compete quite can, well. Can they stay that rich? I don't know. I don't know if a team can enjoy that level of um, luxury at one position. That that's definitely the question that will be asked. Will you, you know, are you going to cut? Are you going to cut? I mean, they're they're deeper at defensive back than they are wide receiver. Um. So it's true. I think there is a chance that they might cut a defensive back, uh, which I'd I'd hate to see. Yeah, uh, I, I I really like the secondary. I I think they're the best in the league. I think this is the best secondary in the league, and part of that is because of that depth to be able to bring off the bench, like to have someone like you know Amos or 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 Richards yeah. or Deku Butler. They coming were off the bench. good last year. Um, but I feel they have the potential to be game changing this year, you know, in terms of ball hawking, in terms of aggressiveness and 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 turnovers. Uh, I feel they can they can be a force um, where they were good last year, but not not scary in the way that sometimes Hamilton or Montreal could be when they were really firing off. Uh, I, I think we can be that level of, um, you know, game changing. In, in that in that defensive backfield. And then you look at the wide receivers, you, you're in a situation where probably Markeith Ambles is starting on the bench or Brandon Banks. Like, I, I don't see that. So I don't know. You've got one extra guy. And I know you want to plan for injuries, but if we're up against the cap, something's got to go there because you are paying Darius Daniels, Eric Rogers, Markeith Ambles, Brandon Banks, Juwan Breskison, Curly Gittens Jr. Uh, is is not going anywhere. Like these, there's there's too many guys. And so while you would love to keep all these guys, if a move needs to be made, if it's not DB, then it's then it's receiver. And this is where something like AJ Richardson coming in, if he looks great in camp, now are you suddenly looking at what the market is, what the trade value is for? For your guys, for for Eric Rogers, for Devers Daniels, I, I hope not. But I can't. This could be a situation. I can't we're in. imagine having re-signed Daniels. He's so good too. You know, like obviously, you know. I mean, I had my, you know, I had my reservations about uh, about Daniels, but clearly they were not shared by the organization. So I can't imagine that they will have changed their minds so much that he is on their list. I think probably Rogers is is on the list if they're if they're going to make a move from from wide receiver. Daniels didn't have like typical number 1 receiver numbers last year, but he had some amazing moments. You remember that that Thanksgiving yeah, he, Day he, catch in Hamilton, uh some of the highlight reel plays he made. To, and then when he was on his own, once Rodgers got hurt and it was just Daniels, he moved into the slot where he really hasn't played much at all and looked amazing. Yeah, to use an NBA reference, you know, he was Terrence Ross. Like <laughs> he, he, he was like Kobe, 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 Jordan. Where is that guy? He, he, you know, they just just the 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 ceiling is high, 
but it's also a deep basement. He's way more consistent than Terrence Ross. I, you can't insult Daniels like that. I'm not insulting Terrence him. Terrence Ross is I a, love Terrence Ross, is an but Terrence Ross had NBA player. That is not an insult. <laughs> He, Terrence Ross had like one great game every season. Terrence Ross has played 10 years in the NBA, sir. <laughs> yes, I know, but not as like a number one option. And that's what Daniels is. Right. He's an ex. Like, so. do, I do not doubt his talent. I And well, we can talk about scheme and maybe they didn't go to him enough. But um, I want more from him this year. I want, you know, I want him to be a weapon that... Um, that they use more. I, I, I think that he needs to be the focal point of, of the offense. And we'll see if that's scheme or if that's some of his inconsistencies. Because, um, you know, there were definitely times where he disappeared for long stretches. And that that just can't happen. I, I don't think. And it certainly can't happen with the money you're paying him now. This past weekend was the CFL Combine, and it was combined with the Global Combine, which was kind of cool. So, and cool literally and figuratively. I don't know if I've ever been so cold in my life. At the last day of the Combine on Sunday, we were in the Dome at uh, Varsity Stadium, and it was about minus 10 degrees uh, inside that Dome. And I don't know how, you know, I was there with my, my winter coat on, my hands in my pockets. I don't know how Marshall Ferguson and those guys did five straight hours of uninterrupted CFL coverage wearing no jacket. Uh, just absolutely frozen solid. And you can still check that out. If you wanted to see any of the footage from the Combine, it is still available on the CFL YouTube channel. Uh, it's, it, there's a lot of coverage. But what's great about the CFL Combine, unlike uh, other Combines, unlike the NFL Combine, along with the drills, so you can see you know, the 40s, three cone, um, your shuttles and, and everything else. They also have one-on-ones. Uh, I, not only do I love the one-on-ones, but at the end of one-on-ones, you get like call-outs where different matchups are specifically sought after and so you can see well okay well that guy looked really good how will he look against this guy how will he look against this guy I got a lot of stuff out of watching the linemen uh, watching the uh, receiver DB one-on-ones uh, there was some fantastic info there but more than watching the players I was really trying to watch uh, the Argos I was trying to watch all of the Argos that were represented there and to see who they were paying special attention to. And obviously they're not new to this because I got very little out of that experience. Uh, They played their cards pretty tight. Uh, There's like one global guy that I thought, well, maybe they're paying some special attention here. But other than that, I I couldn't tell who they were interested in. They seem to be engaged in just about everything. So one of the the few organizations that, that didn't take a break from the cold in there, they... They stuck with it and watched all those drills from start to finish and were paying as close attention as they could to just about everybody. So I don't really have any insight in terms of who the Argos are looking at. I was kind of thinking about it in terms of who I would be looking at if I were them as the day progressed and they clearly weren't going to spill the beans. Um, Positionally, we'll do some stuff as the draft gets closer. We'll have a draft-specific episode. But position-wise... You know what's great, JB? I don't even know where they need. You know, when I look out around the league, uh, you know, what other media outlets are projecting for the Argos and their draft picks, they've got so much Canadian talent. There's no glaring position where you say, oh, yeah, they need somebody in here. Like, I know John Hodge was talking about safety as being an Argos need, and I think he had a safety projected in his first mock. Uh, I just don't see that. Like, I like I like Haggerty back there as the the backup for, for Mechie, and, I, you know, you brought Mechie in to be the... The Canadian safety. I think you've already got two guys there you're happy with. I don't think you need to go three deep at that spot, especially when you've got Cahoon and Boteng as Canadian DBs on the roster. Like anything stand out to you? If you're if you're drafting a Canadian, is there someone you're looking at? Uh, I mean, they're in a really great place. Probably um, like uh, a, a run stopper nose if if you can if you can get your hands on one um, would be would be useful. Uh, secondary is pretty locked. Wide receivers locked. Uh, you know, running backs not really worth. I think. I think the pick. Um, you know. Uh, you know. I pr- probably. I mean, probably just. You know, standard. Uh, probably just line. 
you know, they they took a couple linebackers a couple years ago. Those guys are coming through. I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily put another linebacker in that crew. Um, I think for my, for me, you know, you're basically you're just gonna add offensive line, defensive line depth. Yeah, that's basically how I see it. Unless they decide to go the Canadian running back route, you know, if they decided that because they've got Andrew Harris there, they want to make that a Canadian position. And again, I don't think they need to because they've got enough Canadian starters everywhere else. They're so deep with Canadian talent. But that is an option. You know, you've got a couple interesting, inning, uh, you know, running backs in this draft. I, I don't know if I don't know if Mackert's big enough out of Saskatchewan, but I really liked watching him play. He looked really good. And, you know, you bring him in to, is he ready to be Andrew Harris's backup? I, I don't know. I, I'm just, I'm worried about his size, but it's it's possible. And, uh, you know, other than that, I, I, I don't know. I think the good situation is that they can draft best player available. So that's kind of what I expect them to do. You know, if they, if they happen to have locked out and have like a one or two pick, then I would go best player available, right? Because if you can, you know, if you can, if you can catch a star, catch a star, but without the one or two pick to me i you know you're looking for you're looking for depth you're looking for rotational guys there's nothing wrong with finding a great rotational guy who you can i mean this this is a team looking for plug and play in 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 my opinion not looking for developmental guys this is a team looking for like we need you to come in right now and give us you know 20 25 snaps a game um and and fill out what is a very good roster so that's that's quite a good position to be in as a franchise that you don't need to you know hit a home run just need to hit a double this canadian draft class didn't seem to me to be as strong as we've seen it in years past there weren't as many guys that stood out to me there were a few certainly but it just didn't seem to be as deep what i was impressed with was the global guys I, I was actually blown away by some of their performances in the combine, more in the measurables than in in terms of the athleticism that they brought to the combine. Uh, we've got some very talented uh, global athletes in this draft. So, and I don't think that was lost on anybody too. The coaches that I spoke to and the uh, the other uh, media attending the event were equally impressed with what the global players put down uh, on paper. So that was very encouraging to see um, because I know some people had started souring a little bit last year on the, on the global draft, just in seeing what happened with some of the players. There didn't seem to be that many success stories, but I think this year we'll probably change that around a bit. There's there's some guys that are going to be able to contribute right away, at least on, on special teams. And, and I think quite a number of them, you're not just talking about three or four. So uh, I'm excited about this year's global draft. So I will, we'll preview that as we get closer to the actual draft, you know, coming up in about a month's time. JB, the Argos want the CFL to acknowledge the rent disparity <laughs> in Toronto and Vancouver <laughs> compared to the other <laughs> CFL cities. I would like my employer to also recognize my rent disparity. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, so I'm all for it. You know, we've seen this talked about in the NFL and the NHL, Major League Baseball, you've got some states where there's no tax, uh, and that's an attractive thing. You've got, uh, you know, in in hockey, some players not wanting to play for a Canadian team because again, there is there's a tax issue, uh, there's a cost of living issue, but just in the CFL, you've got all the cities that are in Canada, so it's you know equal playing field in terms of taxes, in terms of uh, a lot of other things, but. Uh, not cost of living. You've got Toronto being about three times as expensive as some other places to live. Is there anything the league can do about this or should do about this? No, um, I understand what they're saying, um, but it, it makes sense to me that it's it, it is an issue because CFL players do not make a lot of money, so they're not making hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. And obviously living in downtown Toronto near to the stadium is going to be far more expensive uh, than having a four-story house in Winnipeg. However, uh, you know, the, the flip side of it is you're in Toronto. So you're not in your uh, mud hut in Saskatchewan. So when you want to go out and do something, it's a whole different vibe. And I'm sure that there's a bit of an evening out to that, that, you know, some guys really like the Toronto, Montreal, 
um, you know, city vibe. And that's hard to compete with if you are Winnipeg, Saskatchewan. Um, so to some extent, I think that balances out. I, I, I think it's a fair comment to make. I don't think the Argos are making it in bad faith, but there, there's no way the league is going to allow for a, uh, a Toronto um, living expense uh, cap cir- circumvention, not 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 in uh, not in this time. No, I agree with you. I'd love for something to be done, but I'm very biased on this, and I think you're right. There is far more of a draw to playing in Toronto than a lot of other cities, but yeah, the the it's sort of offset by that cost of living. So I don't expect anything to be done about it. If it is then JB, maybe you can look into getting the same treatment. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I look forward to the precedent. JB, Touchdown Atlantic is back. <laughs> you must be excited that the Saskatchewan Rough Riders will be playing the Toronto Argonauts in Wolfville uh, come uh, this summer. Um, <laughs> it's very odd, this choice that they have made. Um, as my brother mentioned, our, our erstwhile Halifax uh, reporter, I don't know how not playing in Halifax increases people's desire to have a team in Halifax. Um, so that's odd. Obviously, they got no traction at all from the city. Uh, Wolfville is a city of 5,000 people. It's a university town in, in every sense of the word town where Acadia is. And, uh, you know, it's not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. Um it's, it's literally in the middle of nowhere. It's an hour from Halifax. It's in the middle of the province. Uh, I, I, it does not have a stadium. I mean, I guess they're going to build a stadium and build hotels and build restaurants. Well, there is a stadium. It seats like 3,000 people. Well, I mean, they're gonna... so if the goal was to sell 3,000 tickets, then I think it's a slam dunk. And have, but they're going to bring stands. They'll they'll add capacity to that. The hotels, I don't I don't have an answer for. But I imagine they think people are going to drive back, like stay in Halifax and drive to and from. Yeah, if, if it's a midday game, um, it will be. And uh, the tailgating opportunities are probably going to be fantastic because it's taking place in a large field, so people will be able to, I'm sure, find a field of their choice to tailgate. So on that hand, I think it could be a really fun day um, because there will be lots of grounds for kind of casual doing your thing and barbecuing and then walking up to the game. So I do see, you know, my sort of questioning aside, I do see a potential for it to be a real blast because of the tailgating options um, because they live in a lawless pre 20th century world. Um, so that may work out really well, but it is curious that they are hoping people will drive an hour from Halifax. So you don't think people from Halifax are going to make that drive? You think this is <laughs> largely going to be filled up by, by people coming from, from further away? I, well, I don't know. There, there is no further. That's the thing is it's not near New Brunswick. It's not near anywhere else. <laughs> like, you know, it, it, it's a little tricky in that. Halifax might draw people that will come over to Halifax for the weekend and, you know, do some shopping and hang out in the city. Um, will they come and do that and then drive to the game? Maybe. Um, you know, times are very different out east. You know, driving for an hour is is a big deal, to be honest, uh, in Halifax, where most things are basically 20 minutes. So if you're in your car for an hour... Um, It's a bit of an ask. I guess maybe people are going to camp or like make sure that they have a designated driver. Uh, You know, I I think I think there are logistical questions that I have. I I see a road to where it could be really successful, Um, but it certainly raises to me a lot of questions because uh, it... uh, (laughs) <laughs> well, like it's a tiny little stadium in the middle of nowhere. 
Well, I'm sure you will have a great time at the game, JB. Yeah, uh, look, I'm, for us, I'm so. going to bring my tent and my cooler and have a blast. So I'm worried that our post game podcast yeah, may it, it, uh, not be <laughs> as comprehensive as our usual podcast. If you're out there tailgating in your tent no, for two may, days, there may be technical difficulties that push the podcast to the following day. <laughs> All right. Well, that will just about do it for us on our first episode of the 2022 season. Don't forget, we are coming at you weekly from now on until the end of the CFL season, until the end of the playoffs. And, you know, we we foresee good things. I, I feel very good about the Toronto Argonauts. We didn't even get to really talk too much about the team today and how it's constructed, etc. But we'll get into some more of those details going forward. I'm excited to have you back. I'm excited to be back. And we will see you next week. For JB, this is Ben Grant saying so long. And may all your pre-snap reads be good ones. I'll see you.